Well, today we finish up this series that I call uh, God's Promises. Now, uh, we've been marching through this series on taking a look at the promises of God. And keep in mind that the promises of God are not just things that might happen. These are things that the Lord has laid down, says, this is what I will do. And I tell you, that's something that we can all hang our hats on. Am I right here? So as we take a look at these, uh, these promises of God, we've been taking a look at the promises of God about all kinds of things. Well, today we're going to be talking about the promises of God about personal peace. Boy, can anyone use a little bit of that? Hmm? Am I right? Am I right? Well, would it surprise you to hear that uh, the peace of God is not conditional? The, the peace of God is a promise. The problem is we are the ones who need to receive it. That's where it gets a little difficult. But the most wonderful thing about this message series, the common thread that goes through this whole series, is the idea that God is a God who keeps his promises. So far we've taken a look at the idea you can't outgive God, so you don't need to worry about how you actually are generous with your life. We also talked about the richness of heaven. Just imagine our wildest dreams about heaven pale in comparison to what God has already promised us. Can you imagine that God promised promised us the Holy Spirit. In other words, God promised us the Holy Spirit is not some force. It is the very person of God. He promised that we'll have God in us. How wonderful is that? It's great to know that God cares about our future. He cares about where we're going. He cares so much about where we're going, he promised to guide us there. But we need to listen to that still small voice of the Holy Spirit nudging us to the future that he's always always had planned. We also know that he has the power to conquer our fears that stay in the way, that stand in the way of us getting to the place that God wants us to be. We also talked about the idea that God heals, absolutely, no question. We also have to take a look at what God didn't promise. We know that God heals in many wonderful, glorious ways, but he never promised everyone would be healed. But he did charge us, charge us with the responsibility to pray for those. Today we're going to be talking about the peace that God offers. Okay. Peace. Peace. When you think of the phrase, live a life of peace, what goes through your mind? Maybe it's like, hey, peace, man, all right, totally cool, all right. Maybe that's peace. Maybe some of you think about uh, peace as the absence of war, right? I mean, that's peace, yeah. Maybe when you think about peace, maybe what you're talking about is really that we would live live peaceably among us, right? That we wouldn't be in conflict and all that other kind of stuff. Um, But that's really not the peace I'm talking about today. What I'm really talking about today is that personal inner peace, okay? Uh, I preached on this once before in a different church, and someone said, well, why didn't you preach on the absence of war? Why didn't you preach on the fact that we all should get along together? Uh, Why didn't you preach about the collective peace? And you want to know why? Because God didn't promise us that we would be absent from war. God never promised us that we would live at peace with one another. God did promise us that sense, that deep power, that inner peace. I'm looking around at your eyes right now and I see some skeptical looks I see some people are saying, well, if God promised us that, hey, how come I don't got a piece of that kind of piece, huh? Where's mine? Well, that's dealing with this. The promise of God's peace. Now, it is a promise. Make no mistake about it. It is God's peace. 
But have you ever been in that situation where you feel as if, holy cow, like the whole world is pressing in on you. It, it, like, like every part of your life is falling apart. Have you ever had that situation? It feels like the burden of the whole world is resting upon your shoulders. Does it, have you ever been in that situation? No matter how hard you work or no matter what you do, it still feels like your whole life is falling apart right before your hands. Does anyone feel that way? Am I the only one for Pete's sakes? Well, bless you. It must be all have a blessed life. Go go in peace, right? Uh, Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've certainly been in those positions. Lately, I have been in those times where I have felt like not only is the world uh, falling down upon me like I'm going to be crushed by all the cares and the worries and the stress and all that other kind of stuff. And and, and I know what you guys are thinking, wait a second, you're a pastor. That should never affect you, right? I hate to tell you this, uh, but you know, I'm, I'm a human being. I mean, shocker, I know, right? Ultimately, you got to know that I'm a sinner in need of a Savior just like everybody else, Amen. I've just been called to do something else, that's all. And sometimes the weight of the world can be pretty heavy. Have you ever felt like that where it's, where it's like, oh, everything's pressing down around you for like, you know, like all day long. And then maybe not just all day long, but all week. And the weeks turn into a month and the months turn into many months and maybe a year. Well, I've had uh, a pretty awful last couple of months. And it has been uh, stress upon stress upon stress. I don't say that so you feel sorry for me, okay? You've got to listen to where I'm going with the story, okay? So Monday, I was running around the church doing all the things I'm trying to do. And uh, I'm taking care of this, taking care of this. I walk around, I'm, I'm praying, I'm praying, I'm praying, praying for over all the pews, praying over all the church. I'm running around and I, somehow I duck into the kitchen. And who of all people would be there but Travis? Travis is doing his thing in there. And, I, and uh, Travis looked at me like, whoa, <laughs> you know, you look like you're all stressed out. And I said, well, wait till I tell you. You don't know the half of it. Bam, 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 bam. There. I don't know if I actually barked at him, but it kind of felt that way. And, uh, and, they says, and he says, hey, you need some peace. And I said, yeah, and you know something? I'm preaching on peace this Sunday for Pete's sakes. Yeah, no kidding. And then sometime, actually, Travis uh, said the most powerful words I've ever heard. Okay, He said, well, there you go. You guys got to know this. I plan out my message series about a year to 18 months in advance, okay? Um, so I knew that on this particular day, I would be preaching on God's promises about peace. Um, I had no idea what this, day would, this week would bring. But God did. God knew what my week would be like long before I put pen to paper to try to figure this out. That's part of the deal when you actually listen to the still small voice of the Holy Spirit. He will help to give you the peace that doesn't make any sense. Monday night. Um, Part of the stress was it felt like I'm having meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting. People's lives around me are falling apart. I'm running to the hospital dealing with people. Uh, I just want to just rip my hair out. Out of town meetings, traveling, doing all this other kind of stuff, right? And then Monday I have yet another meeting. And it's at night and it always goes far too long. No, No offense. I mean, uh, Rand chairs one of those meetings and you're pretty good about keeping it tight. But it was a vision team meeting. And just between all of us and everyone on TV and broadcasting around the world, so keep it a secret, um, this was a vision meeting, and I was stressed to the hilt about this meeting. 
I did not want to be there because what we're doing in vision is trying to plan out the long distance vision for where we're going as a church. And honestly, we are in a weird place with denominational stuff and blah, blah, blah. And here I'm trying to do my best to steer this true, this church through the murky waters of all that lies before us. And now I got to go to the meeting and do it. I know it's important to do, but it was just another level of stress. Anyone ever feel like you've been in this situation? Give me a little nod. Just give me a little nod, right? But I got to tell you, that was by far the most beautiful meeting I ever ran in my life. And very possibly, that could have been the most beautiful meeting that I ever attended in my life. God is rich and glorious. If we let him guide us there. Long story short about this meeting, we are trying to lay down priorities for the things that we need to do in order for this church to move forward. The number one priority, the number one priority is to put God as number one in our lives. Shocker, right? Now that doesn't mean nothing else counts. All that means is you put God first and the rest of your life should be able to fall behind putting God at uh, first in priority. And we talked about that and it was rich and it was full and the wisdom of the spirit was flowing through everyone there. And our homework assignment was to say, okay, uh, between now and our next meeting, what we need to do is we need to come up with ways that we as the leaders of the church can model this kind of behavior so that we can set a new cultural standard of who we are. And then we close the meeting in prayer. If anyone's ever been to a church meeting, most of the time, when the preacher uh, starts to pray at the end of the meeting, it goes something like this. Oh, Lord, we thank you for all the things you've done. We thank you for this meeting and our time together. Lord, I pray that your blessing would be upon all the decisions we make, that we may go forth in the name of Jesus. Amen. And by the time the preacher says, Amen, out of the amen, everyone's already gathered up all their stuff and put it in their bag, men, and out the door. Here what I said is, hey, after such a beautiful meeting, we just need to be in the presence of the Lord for a while. So I said, I'm going to start us out in prayer, and if anyone else wants to join in, you know, just feel free. So I started us out in prayer, and every single person at that meeting took the time to give his or her own glory to God. And then I wrapped up and... I gave thanks to the Lord, and Lord, oh Lord, we thank you for all this. Uh, We give you this in your name, amen. And no one moved. No one was ready to stop praying. I knew that before I even opened up my eyes. So I opened my eyes a little, and everyone else was head down and hands up. So we sat there. I prayed out loud a little, way, a, li- a, a little bit of that. But for the most part, we were in silence, soaking in the Lord. I wish I would have put a timer on it, but it must have been another 15 minutes, 10, 15 minutes at least. By the time we were done, I felt like, okay, we were all kind of saying, this was good. This was amazing. And the Lord just sort of released us. How does this fit into my nasty week, you might be asking. The rest of the week was the same as it was before. I had meeting after meeting after meeting. People's lives were falling apart. I had to go, go out of town. Uh, people were sick. The people, one of the persons I was supposed to meet on my out-of-town meeting, she had a stroke, and now I'm just like, ah! But you know, my schedule didn't change, okay? But the peace of the Lord made it possible 
for me to enter into all of those things in his presence. The peace of God does not mean that your circumstances have changed. The peace of the Lord does not mean when the world feels like it's coming down around you, God does not push the world aside. That's not his promise. His promise, however, is even more mind-blowing than that. The Apostle Paul writes it like this. This comes from Philippians chapter 4. Now, admittedly, most people, when they think of Philippians chapter 4, they think of rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. And talking about uh, all of the, the Lord is near. We need to be grateful in all things. And then do not be anxious about any, everything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request before God, full stop. A lot of people forget that next verse. I think it's because they don't understand it. Because I know it's not meant to be understood. Let's take this from the top. Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation... By prayer and petition, with thanksgiving in our hearts, present our request before God. And the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Jesus Christ. Do you understand what this says? And the peace of God that transcends understanding, goes beyond understanding, goes beyond comprehension. In other words, it doesn't make sense. The peace of God that doesn't even make sense will guard your hearts and minds in Jesus Christ. So after that meeting, I felt the peace of God that goes beyond understanding because the situation hadn't changed. I still had everything else pouring down around me, but what God said was this. If you give it to me, I won't stop the world, but I'll guard your heart. I won't take away the things that give you stress, but I'll guard your mind so you don't have to stress. Oh, God is good. He is holy and righteous and true. We, on the other hand, get it stuck in our minds that say, here is the world around me. These are the things that are pressing into our lives. And we often say, Lord, I can't handle another bit of it. Meanwhile, all the time, God is saying, I know you can't. Let me do it. Let me guard you from all these things. The world will still be the world, but I love you enough to get you through it. But some of you might be thinking to yourself, you don't know what I'm going through. My situations are way worse than that. You see, we can have peace in the midst of any circumstance, no matter what's going on in your life. Now, this may seem kind of silly, but honestly, I like a good funeral. Hey, anyone like a funeral? Yeah. I can see a lot of people shaking their head, no, sir, re, Bob, I do not. But, you know, I, I wish I would have kept a more detailed record, but I think I've done somewhere between four and 500 funerals in my ministry, okay? Some of them have been times where the, the family and everyone there is just crushed. Some of them have been times where the person who passed away was no surprise. But more often than not, a funeral can be a good day. It really can. Because that peace of God 
that goes beyond understanding. In other words, the circumstances are too big for us, but not too big for God. At the early service, we sang a song called, It Is Well With My Soul. Anyone ever heard that song? It is well with my soul. I should not be singing. I'm sorry, Travis. I should have let that one up to you. But in this song, uh, anyone know the story behind that song? Okay, the story behind that song is really cool. I'm just going to give you a very brief uh, 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 version of this story. Uh, there was this family who was going to get on a ship and sail across the Atlantic into, uh, over to Europe. Uh, but the guy had some things he needed to tidy up and to fix back in America. So he sent the rest of the family off on the ship, and they went over to Europe. And the ship sank. Everyone gone. He was heartbroken. He was crushed. So he had to get on the next ship in order to go there to, I hate to say this, but retrieve the remains and rebuild his life. On the way over, at a certain time, the captain called him. And he said, we are now over the place where the ship sank and your family perished. He looked over the railing at the ocean going beneath him and he felt this enormous sense of the power of God giving him peace. When peace like a river attendeth my way, he can say, it is well. It is well with my soul. You see, the circumstances are too big for us. The circumstances are insignificant compared to God. The Apostle Paul continues on, uh, in Philippians 4 this way. He says, I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. He goes on to say, I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether hungry or well-fed, whether living in plenty or in want. And then he says these glorious words, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. You see, our situations are often too big for us, but they're not too big for God. And that does not mean that the circumstances that we see along our lives are strong enough to block the peace of our Lord and Savior for giving us what we need to move on. The last thing I want to share with you today is one of those quirky little things that is not necessarily unique to Methodism, but certainly is one of the cornerstones of the whole Methodist theology. And that is the idea that peace comes from assurance. Assurance just simply means that we do not have to doubt about our salvation, that we do not have to doubt about God. We don't need to wonder whether or not that we're going to heaven. Uh, maybe you've seen some of these surveys when people say, so if you got hit by a bus today, where would you be? And they would say, well, you know, I kind of hope I might get into heaven. You know, that's the thing is where you really don't know, you're unsure, and that can add stress to your life. But the assurance of God says you don't have to worry about it. In fact, my southern brothers and sisters often say it like this. Are you ready? This is the way they describe assurance. They say, I know that I know that I know I'm on my way to heaven. Did you follow all those you knows? I know that I know that I know I'm on my way to heaven. And that is the assurance. I don't need to doubt a thing. In other words, I get it. In other words, there's nothing that you can do, Lord, that can keep me from being with you forever. You know, I just love when the Bible says that he holds us in his hand. 
I want to share with you a couple of passages of Scripture. This one comes from Hebrews, and it's just a brilliant piece of uh, writing from Hebrews 11. is all about the faith of those who went before us. But somehow people sometimes skip the first couple of verses. Here's what the author of Hebrews says like this. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. So faith is confidence in assurance. Faith is confidence in assurance about things over which we have no control. Faith is about confidence in the assurance of God, even though we have no control over it. We put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ because we have confidence in him. We have assurance in his grace, not upon us. It rightly puts the stress of all the universe not on our shoulders, people, but upon the one who carried the weight of the world, who willingly went to the cross, who willingly already took the weight. So we can be set free. Hmm. One other passage I want to share with you, and this comes from my favorite chapter, I think, of all Scripture, and that comes from Romans 8. And this is just a few verses from Romans 8. But he says, For I am convinced... And then he goes on this cool laundry list that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers or things present or things to come or powers or heights nor depths or anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ. If you boil out all the adjectives the Apostle Paul is saying, I am convinced that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ, including the world around us, including of all the things we fear, including all those things that stress us out. Anyone ever hear, um, um, ever watch Veggie Tales? Any Veggie Tales fans out there? Oh, a couple of them, okay. You remember Veggie Tales, Veggie Tales. Okay, I'm not going to sing. I love you guys far too much. And this is the second time I've tried today. But you know, basically, if you've never seen Veggie Tales, it is an animated series about vegetables who give praise and honor and glory to God. Pretty cool, right? And in the very first episode, it's about this guy named Junior Asparagus. Okay, he's an asparagus. He really is. And he's watching this horror story and ah, all these monsters. And uh, he says, time to go to bed, Junior. He says, four more minutes. And then finally, he has to go up to bed and he crawls into bed. And now he's just scared of the dark and everything. And so he calls in mom and dad, oh, the the boogeyman's here. And then they sing a song. God is bigger than the boogeyman. He's bigger than the monsters or the, no, and the monsters on TV. Anyway, something like that, right? God is bigger than any boogeyman. God is bigger than anything that would possibly stand in our way. God is bigger than life or death. God is bigger than angels or demons. God is bigger than anything we face now or could ever face in the future. God is bigger than absolutely everything of all creation. And not only is he bigger than that, he loves us so much that he will not let anything come in the way between the love of God and you and me. That, my friends, is peace that'll blow your mind because it doesn't make any sense by our standards. But God laid out that promise before the foundations of the earth. He promised it to you and me. I think it might be a pretty cool idea if we receive that, if we trust that that's a promise and we can live out of that. 
in a couple of minutes, we're all going to pray together. And when we pray together today, it, it's my hope that each one of us in your own way may think about all the things that keep us down and remember the promise that he will guard us. And then it would be certainly my hope is that we would all open up our hearts ready to receive what God has to offer. I know you've heard me say this before, but once again, I invite you, if you would like to pray with your palms open, and this is nothing mystical or magical. It's a reminder to us that we are here not just to give, but we're here to receive what God has to offer. Oh my God, I hope we all today receive peace. Let's pray together. Oh, Lord Jesus, we thank you. We praise you. We rejoice that you are a God who keeps his promises. And you have promised us from the very foundations of the world, oh Lord, that you will never leave us nor forsake us. Nothing is too big to crush us as long as you are God and you are here and we receive what you have to offer. Oh, precious Lord Jesus, pour out your spirit upon each person here. I would pray that you would pour out your spirit in such a real and palatable way that you would give all of us the assurance that you are God, that you are here, and we are safe in your hands. For all this we give you in Jesus' precious and holy name.